David Troxell is an internationally known expert in Alzheimer's disease and memory care. He's worked for over 25 years in the Alzheimer's field, developing and teaching care techniques as a consultant, writer, and speaker. He co-authored the book, The Best Friends Approach to Alzheimer's Care, along with many other influential books and resources relating to Alzheimer's care and training. And I invite you all to visit his website to learn more. It's bestfriendsapproach.com. And David is such a good friend of Home Instead. We have worked with David over the years in various capacities. We feel like he's part of our Home Instead family. Uh, we really just appreciate all of his ongoing support for our dementia training uh, and education program. So David, welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. Well, thank you, Lakeland. It's great to be here from Omaha, where you are, to Sacramento, California, where I am, and to be part of this fascinating topic. You know, um, uh, I, I think having worked in this field for so many years, I remember a time, Lakeland, when there was still tremendous stigma about Alzheimer's, you know, back in the 1980s when I started, uh, people would often ask us to send out information, you know, before the internet back then, we, we'd mail a package from the, when I worked at the University of Kentucky Alzheimer's Center, and it wasn't uncommon to um, have people say, now, please don't put the return address on the envelope, you know, I don't want anybody to know I have Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. my mother does. And, and I think that issue of stigma very much even relates to our conversation today, because back in the 80s, you know, much of the literature talked about sort of a person with dementia being a shadow of their former selves or being a victim, and they kind of lost that, that personhood. And, and to me, I, I think a lot of what we're talking about today is not only how we <clears throat> keep the person with dementia spiritually connected, but, you know, how we keep ourselves uh, fueled as, as caregivers. And, and I think good care is really maybe the ultimate in, in, in being spiritual and, and spiritually caring for somebody and, and valuing the person underneath this cloak of dementia. And of course, a lot of that is knowing and using their life story, particularly when it comes to uh, religion and, and spirituality. Yeah, that person-centered care is really where the whole field of dementia care has gone. And I think for very good reason, to your point, there the individual, just because they have a diagnosis of dementia doesn't mean that they're not a person any longer. They still have uh, likes, dislikes. Uh, part of who they were before dementia is still very much part of who they are after a dementia diagnosis. And, and that spirituality and religion uh, for so many is an important part of I love how you said their personhood. Um, and so when we think about you know, a holistic care for individuals living with dementia, it's really important that we, we talk about that spirituality and religion uh, because they, that's part of the whole person. Um, and so David, I thought we could start today by kind of just explaining the difference between religion and spirituality. I think sometimes there's confusion or misconception there. Sure. Well, uh, I'm not going to pretend, Lakeland, that I have the be-all and end-all definition, because I'm sure we could get a panel of philosophers and uh, clergy members on, on the, the webinar and have a two-hour debate. But, you know, very simply put, um, many people, particularly in the U.S. and around the world, of course, are religious. And they typically means, for me, that they belong to a faith community or at least subscribe to kind of a defined set of, of religious principles. You know, if you're a Roman Catholic, if you're Jewish, if you're Protestant, uh, you, you kind of have a certain way of looking at the world and you, you identify in that way. Um, I think many of us are religious, uh, but not all of us, of course, as you said in your opening remarks. But I personally believe, Lakeland, uh, that all of us are spiritual. All of us have a spirit, uh, whether you're formally religious or not. And to me, uh, your spiritual self is really what gives you meaning, purpose, value, to me, kind of how you move in the world. Uh, to me, it's, it's spiritual to be a caregiver. It's spiritual to, to be kind, to, to be in nature, to be with children, with animals. And, and so for me, when it comes to the person with dementia, you know, we, we want to know their history. And if, if they have been, uh, for example, Roman Catholic, maybe they're moving their hands and maybe they're looking for the rosary beads. If, if I didn't know that about them, I might not be able to connect them to their spiritual things, favorite hymns and prayers and music. So, so, so again, I think many of us are religious. I like to say that all of us are spiritual, uh, but in dementia care, we, we want to uh, focus on both depending on the person's own uh, past and social history. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for kind of defining both of those terms. And, um, and, and we've been talking about how it is uh, these religion and spirituality, these terms, um, they they are important to people living with dementia and their caregivers. And I think sometimes people think, well, 
Um, as the person progresses through the disease, they're losing um, you know, parts of their personality or um, parts of their memories. And, and that, that spirituality and religion isn't as important. But why, why, David, would you argue that it is important for people living with dementia? Well, a, a couple of things. I, I think one is that, you know, you, you kind of said this as much in some of your opening remarks, Lakeland, that, you know, when somebody has Alzheimer's, they often lose the ability to initiate, right? And mm -hmm. when you think about it, maybe, Lakeland, maybe on Sundays, you, you know, get dressed up and you jump in your car and you go to a service somewhere, uh, I guess, post pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. But a person with dementia may not be able to put themselves together, you know, may not be able to get out of the house, certainly not be able to drive. So there's to me a very simple example is if, if I know that <clears throat> someone really values that as a caregiver, <clears throat> pardon me, I'm, I'm gonna try my best to, you know, help them maybe get to a faith service, uh, maybe even an off hour one, things like that. But on a very simple level, uh, I think that we can cue the person about their faith. We can sing a religious song. We can you know, do a favorite Bible passage or some other kind of spiritual passage with them. And if we kind of push the start button, it's amazing how they can run with it. And I think in dementia care, uh, one thing as a caregiver, we have to often set things up for success, initiate. We can't just you know, put a spiritual book in front of somebody and say, I'll see you in an hour. They're not going to look at it. So I, I think to me, uh, it's very important because again, when the person with dementia, Alzheimer's disease or one of these other dementias, when they feel safe, secure, valued, loved, uh, I think it, it builds their self-esteem. It reduces dementia-related behavior. It fosters cooperation. And so, you know, early in this webinar, I guess what I want to say is we, we, we care spiritually because we are, um, I hope we wired that way to be loving and supportive, but <clears throat> it's also strategic that if that person's doing well with their spirit, with their self-esteem, with their sense of value, mm -hmm. I think caregiving becomes easier for the caregiver as well. Yeah, those are some great points. And, um, it, you know, those, those things that you mentioned, you know, helping them start the activity, that's, that can also, that can be uh, a barrier for them for a variety of different things uh, that they're doing throughout their, their day. And so spirituality and those mm -hmm. religious activities um, are just kind of another, just part of their daily routine that care, care partners can um, kind of be thinking about. And I think sometimes it just, it doesn't always come top of mind. There's so many things often that the care partners are concerned about making sure that they're eating and getting their medications. But again, <laughs> if we think about that whole person, uh, that the spirituality part is, is really, really important. I think you're right, Lakeland. And, and you know, a word that often comes to mind when you think about kind of formal religious practice is ritual, you know, the rituals. Mm, yeah. Many, many religions have certain rituals, you know, the stations of the cross or, you know, um, other things. Uh, and, and I think rituals are actually very intriguing for dementia care. My, my mother was Canadian and she had a ritual of drinking Earl Grey tea with milk every day. And that was something we recognized. Uh, so the word ritual, I think, really works well with religious care, too, because if if you can start off somebody with the Lord's Prayer or uh, talk to them about, you know, their 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 uh, their their practices uh, on a Sabbath, um, you know, again, it kind of evokes these these things that have been imprinted in your brain. You know, when you do things over and over again, be it Earl Grey tea with milk or say the Lord's Prayer at night, things like that. Um, I, I think really la are, are more lasting imprints in your memory and, and you have a better chance of, of kind of cueing them and having them run with it then because it is such an old tradition and ritual, something they practice for so many years. Yes, most certainly. And I think one of the misconceptions that you and I have talked about, David, is that, you know, if somebody doesn't have a religious background, that they don't have spiritual needs. And I think that is a big misconception. And I think that the two don't have to be... Um, uh, is it the word synonymous? <laughs> I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the word, but you don't have to have both. Uh, right. So somebody could, maybe they didn't grow up with religious background, but they still have spiritual needs, or maybe they're not spiritual now in, in their, or they weren't spiritual towards the later half of their life, but they grew up going to church. And so mm -hmm. uh, maybe some of those old rituals are now comforting to them in the various stages of dementia, uh, or maybe um, even just getting out in nature could be a way that they connect spiritually. Yes, very good points. And I think also, you know, again, kind of as we're coming out of the pandemic and, you know, faith communities are, are more able to be, be together in, in, in person, 
uh, you know, one thing Lakeland, you and I have talked about, and I always admire about Home Instead, you, you understand that so much of the treatment for dementia is activity and engagement. Well, I, I like to say the brain loves company, the brain loves company, and, and, and this idea of sort of socialization being so important, and there's even evidence for this, you know, there's evidence that people who have friends, people who are active socially, people who are with other people may get Alzheimer's disease later in life than the loners, right? And so uh, going right back to the basics, what is church? What is going to the temple? What is going to your faith community? It's also engagement and socialization, it's being with other people. Uh, I think that's very, very positive. So, uh, you know, I, I think as I, as I kind of the word spiritual and, and spiritual needs, I, I would say they're really human needs, aren't they, Lakeland? You know, we all I think we all have a need to be needed, a need to be purposeful, hopefully a need to be loved, a, a need to um, you know, be in community, uh, feel safe. And, and, and sometimes, again, when you're a caregiver, if the person's not experiencing these things, you know, if they're in a, in a bad way, uh, I, I think it, it, it fosters depression, which we know is a huge, uh, I, I think the Alzheimer's Association Lakeland says something like 40% of people with Alzheimer's disease will experience periods of depression during their course of illness. So these are all things that can drag the person down and, and really make the caregiving situation much more challenging. Most certainly. Yeah, I, um, you made so many good points there, David, and that connection and community um, for people, especially after we've, we've been lacking that for the last year, um, can really be um, so, so meaningful and uh, purposeful along someone's uh, religious journey or spiritual journey, or um, even just that, that connection with others can be just so, so key. Um, and and all, along the lines of this topic, I recently listened to a podcast series. Uh, the podcast is Dementia Dialogue. I think we have the link that we can drop in. Um, but they've just been having a really interesting conversation about how spirituality is not dependent upon cognition, but rather it's being about or it's rather it's being about fully alive. And actually, Wendy commented uh, here in the chat, equally alive, equally human. And so I think that um, you know, this, there's so many different ways that we can express our spirituality. Um, and on the podcast, the, one of the women was talking about when she is outdoors and is connecting with nature, that's when she feels spiritually alive. And so I know there are various ways people can express their spirituality and religion. There's activities that uh, can be done. So David, would you mind sharing some of those uh, ways that people can engage or maybe some ideas for caregivers on how they can initiate this for their loved ones? Sure. <clears throat> Pardon, forgive my craggly voice this morning. I made the mistake of being outside for a little while this morning in the pollen and we're having you know, the <laughs> okay. allergy days in Sacramento. Um, so, so, you know, I, I think I'd break this down very simply. I think, I think these categories probably meld together. But, you know, when I think about providing spiritual care, I think about being in nature. I think we've covered that. I mean, and again, the, the contemporary view of dementia care that I write about in my Best Friends Approach books, I know Home Instead preaches, is that people with dementia are, are really just like the rest of us. They have the same needs, emotions, feeling, dis, feelings, despite the cognitive loss. And, you know, I guess what I say is, how do any of us feel when we see a rainbow? How do any of us feel when we see a shooting star? Uh, when we see a kitten or a puppy, right? Um, when we see a beautiful field of lavender or flowers, right? All of these things, I think, really connect us with Mother Nature, uh, with the universe, with the world, and, and I think are very soothing and healing. Uh, so the spiritual activities, like being outdoors, helping others. Uh, one of my favorite activities, like when you could do at home so easily, is to make dog biscuits and donate them to the local animal shelter. Now, when I say to my mother or father, gee, mom, would you like to make some dog biscuits with me? They're going to say, oh, no. <clears throat> I don't think so. I'm busy. Or I don't want to have that silliness. But if I say to them, you know, mom and dad, um, the local shelters lost a lot of their funding and, and they really need our help. Would you help me? I'd love to help the local animal shelter. I could sure use your help. Why don't we make uh, 50 dog biscuits for them and put them in the oven? Oh, OK. You know, again, when you frame and that's one suggestion I have for the people on the webinar, if you're a caregiver, is, you know, if you if you frame a request as helping others or helping you or I need your help. And, and maybe you finish the batch and you say, mom, thank you. Hey, we're gonna go down and make a lot of those chihuahuas happy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> mom, what would I do without you? You know, that affirmation, that praise. So spiritual care, helping others, being outdoors, um, 
uh, arts, creativity, writing a poem together, listening to music. A friend of mine says his mother's spiritual connectedness is listening to opera, right? So mm -hmm. music, arts, being in nature, helping others, being with friends, family, children, those are all things that I think feed our spirits. Most well, certainly. Those are some great examples, David. I think I love the idea of, of asking someone to help you uh, because, again, helping others does give us that sense of meaning and purpose. Um, and so those are some, some great suggestions. Um, and I know you mentioned music. And we know just from um, the literature, I, I've seen it personally in the work that I've done. I love the, the movie Alive Inside where they take music to individuals living with dementia and you can just see them literally brighten up. And, and a lot of times um, our religion and spirituality is tied to music. I mean, I can remember the, the songs I learned in Sunday school and, you know, you just, those, um, those songs stick with you. And so uh, when we are thinking about, especially from a, a care partner, caregiver perspective, how we can help our loved ones connect, David, would you say music is is one of the great ways to to help foster that yes, spirituality? And you're you're absolutely right, Lakeland. <clears throat> and we know that music and song lyrics actually live in a different part of the brain than words and language. They actually survive kind of the onslaught of Alzheimer's even more so than words and language. So I'm a huge fan of you know getting a smart speaker in mom's room and say you know Alexa play Frank Sinatra or whatever. Um, you know having music uh, playing. Uh, music evokes memory, even with people with dementia, it evokes emotion. Um, mm -hmm. And again, just like my earlier statement, you know, what do people with Alzheimer's need? Sometimes the th same things we do. Most of us, you know, when I'm working late on a project, I put on some music to give me some energy, right? Mm -hmm. So music definitely changes the mood. I, I'd recommend a great resource, um, Lake, Lakeland. I think you're a fan of his too, but I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the late Dr. Oliver Sacks, S A C K S. Uh, a famous, wonderful neurologist played by Robin Williams in the movie Awakenings. He wrote a beautiful book on music and the brain called Musicophilia. You can probably find it on Amazon. And, and he, he did a lot of work in writing about Alzheimer's disease. And he said music, <clears throat> very important. And I think particularly for people with a religious background, playing some religious music, you know, singing songs. I mean, they've been doing that, as you said, Lakeland, since they were in Sunday school. And that's a very successful religious activity. Thank you for sharing that. And thanks for sharing that book. Uh, that could be very helpful to some folks that uh, want to learn more about music and, and the brain. Um, and we talked about the person centeredness and how it's really important to get to know the person living with dementia so that you can discover their, how they connect to religion and spirituality. And, and I know at Home Instead, when we are training our caregivers, we encourage them um, to, to do that, to get to know the person and their life story. And, and for a lot of people, religion and spirituality is a big part of that. And there's just a couple of caregiver stories that come to mind uh, for me that I've experienced over the years. One of our male caregivers, he started working with a gentleman and learned that he used to be a deacon or um, he used to be an usher of sorts at his faith community. And um, his wife just wasn't able to take him to church uh, because of her mobility issues. So that was one activity that they did together. Every morning, they would get up and get ready for the day and go to the, the religious service. And uh, the caregiver was surprised at how many people recognized this gentleman. And it seemed that he was able to connect back to that community. And so I know some people at times are, are hesitant or nervous to take their loved one to um, a place of worship or uh, because there might be a lot of, of moving parts, people in the audience, music happening. And some of those old cathedrals, there's some even uh, reverberation and echoing. And so I guess, David, if it, do you have any tips for family uh, family caregivers, care partners that are wanting to take their loved one to a place of worship, but might be a little hesitant. Sure, sure, Lakeland. And, and, you know, just again, be really clear. I mean, you know, certainly we know that people with dementia sometimes get pretty disinhibited. And, uh, you know, I guess it could be a bit embarrassing if mom's uh, saying, you know, I can't hear the minister or, you know, I don't, we're you know, making kind of you know, critical remarks about the sermon or something. Um, so, so that can be an issue. Of course, hopefully people are understanding, but also, you know, certainly many people with dementia don't do well in a large crowd with a lot of things going on, it can be stressful. So I think the easy answer, Lakeland, is to 
you know, go to a, a service. Many churches have services on Wednesdays or other other times of day mm -hmm. when there's a, a less less of a crowd. Um, I also had a caregiver once who would just take mom to the church just for an hour or so, just to sit in the pews and soak it all in, and mm -hmm. almost have their own religious service. But I thought it was very very clever and 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 wise. Uh, and of course, you know, many, many services because of the pandemic are now on television or streamed. And I think that's still a, a value for people. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd say adapt your services. And I would also be very um, proactive in talking to your chaplain or rabbi or your faith leader and, and saying, hey, my mother has Alzheimer's or my wife or husband, or my partner has Alzheimer's. Uh, you know, what are your thoughts? What would be the best way for me to keep my, my family member spiritually connected? And, and I will say 10, 15 years ago, a lot of churches I, I felt and faith communities were really not doing a good job, honestly, Lakeland, you know, mm -hmm. kind of protecting and loving and welcoming people with dementia. They, they maybe didn't quite understand, but I think there's um, a much more education now. And I think many uh, faith communities have kind of elder outreach groups and things like that to be a more welcoming space for people with cognitive loss. Yeah, most certainly. One of our partners, Us Against Alzheimer's, one of their uh, communities is Clergy Against Alzheimer's. And we'll put mm. that link in, in the, the chat. Uh, they really help uh, clergy uh, or religious leaders uh, understand dementia and provide them with tools on how they can be a more welcoming community. So I appreciate those, those tips, David. And hopefully for those listening, that those were helpful. Um, I know that, um, you know, Spirituality and religion can sometimes be a taboo topic. They say, you know, you don't talk about politics and don't talk about religion and uh, don't talk about intimacy. Those are kind of the three to stay away from. But uh, again, this this spiritual spirituality and religion is is part of that holistic care. So, uh, any tips for people who are maybe a little hesitant to have this conversation or hesitant to um, connect with with the person that they're caring for in this way? Sure. Well, a couple of thoughts I have, and maybe going back to that kind of fancy word I used earlier about stigma and the sense of shame about dementia, I, I will say, you know, the great thing is that is fading so rapidly. You and I are both fans of this group called Alzheimer's Disease International. They did a whole mm -hmm. annual report about the, the decline in stigma, which I, I think Home Instead helped with. But, um, you know, I think be open, be honest, because one in three American families are caregivers for somebody with cognitive loss. So there's a lot of help, a lot of people out there. Um, I, I think, again, talk to your faith community leader and, and, and kind of rolling back, Lakeland, to your thought about kind of life story work. I, I would write a little top 10 card about ways to spiritually connect with my mom or ways to, you know, make a connection in general. And, and it could be, you know, that she likes coffee with two sugars and two creams. It could be that she doesn't want to be called Catherine. She likes to be called Kitty. It could be that she, she was a nurse and she loves it when you call her nurse kitty or talk about her nursing career, but it might also be, you know, some of her faith practices and interests and favorite hymns and prayers and songs, things like that. And yet we are living in a really diverse world. E even years ago, Virginia Bell, my, my longtime writing partner on the best friends approach, uh, we had a, a woman in Lexington, Kentucky, who was Buddhist, who was in our adult day center for people with dementia. When she got agitated, we would give her a little bronze Buddha. She'd hold it in her hand and kind of just kind of almost go up and down and hold it. And, and it was always like a meditation or prayer with this Buddha that would help her relax and feel so connected with the world and the universe uh, and a higher power. So I think, you know, again, uh, you know, having some of these ideas out there in case there is a, a home instead caregiver, in case mom has to go to the ER, you know, be, being sure people know someone's values and interests can be very, very helpful. I guess what I would say, though, going back to our broader spirituality piece, Lakeland, is to know someone, I think, is spiritual connection. When I, when, mm -hmm. when you feel like I know you and you know me in dementia care, that's so powerful. And kindness and, and, and empathy and warmth. Um, you know, I, I, I really want to write an essay on this that I haven't had a chance to yet. But you know, Maya Angelou, who we, we all so loved, I mean, one of her famous, famous quotes is people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. And she didn't write that about Alzheimer's, but I think it's just the perfect dementia quote, because it really is about how all of us can can help this person feel safe, secure and valued. And and, and uh, you know, I think this 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 is a great way for us to provide this great spiritual connection. 
Yeah, absolutely. I love that my my Angelo quote. I'm glad that you shared that. It's so true. They won't forget how you made them feel. Oh, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I know kind of one of the last couple questions that I, I wanted to cover before we open it up to everyone. So I've seen a few questions come in so far. So be thinking in, uh, of your questions and feel free to chat them in. Uh, but for those that have a loved one living in a long-term care community, um, sometimes um, maybe due to the community's lack of knowledge or time or budget or even comfort level, sometimes the spiritual needs of an individual could be overlooked. So if a, if a family caregiver has a loved one living in a facility, how can they make sure that their loved one's spiritual needs are met? Or, or maybe there's only you know, one type of religious service offered and mm-hmm. doesn't align with their loved one's um, religious preferences. Could you maybe talk a little bit about that, David? Well, really good question. I, you know, I, I, I think it, I think number one is, I think if you are looking for a new uh, uh, placement in assisted living, memory care, or, you know, elder living in general, I, I would be very upfront, you know, hey, my, my dad is of the Jewish faith, um, you know, what kind of services or programs can you offer him? Are you willing to, uh, you know, be creative and think about ways to connect with him, even maybe if you live in a place where there aren't that many other Jewish residents. Uh, so I think, I think being very proactive upon your <clears throat> admissions piece, <clears throat> pardon me. <clears throat> um, and I think also, uh, you know, I, I think maybe bringing in, you know, even being your own care manager, talking to the various faith communities. And I think you would probably have to ask that maybe your own chaplain come and visit mom. <clears throat> And pardon me, my voice here. So I, I think you might have to become, unfortunately, like when your own care manager, because um, I am hoping that if your father, mother, family member is a member of a faith community, they will support that person even after they move into memory care. Yeah, and I think one one thing we were talking about earlier, David, too, is that uh, for family members, um, their loved one living in a community might start attending, maybe if they were always uh, of the Uh, Jewish faith, and they started attending the Christian or Lutheran service, uh, the family member might think, oh my goodness, what is going on? Uh, (laughs) They might just be a little perplexed by it. Uh, Can you maybe speak to that a little bit, David? Uh, Because I think think that that it's just something interesting for, for people to consider. Well, well, first of all, Lakeland, thank you very much. I think I got my voice back here. So, you know, again, I think when someone is in a, an assisted living building, you know, you, your goal as a family member is to work with that community to, to develop a care plan that's the best for your family member. So don't hesitate to ask, you know, if you if you see they only have, you know, an Episcopal priest coming in once a week and you'd like to have more diversity, talk to them about it. Again, check with your own faith community as well. But I, I guess what I would say is, you know, and, and I think maybe you've heard the story about my mom, Lakeland, but my, my mother was not actually a particularly religious person, but her building when she lived in memory care would have different speakers, different chaplains or different members of different faith communities come in and she would go to all of them. It was so interesting. I, I think late in life, perhaps many of us do return to a more, you know, spiritual quest and, uh, you have to remember too that perhaps maybe maybe I was raised a Catholic, maybe I left the church in my 20s, but now I have dementia. You know, you're kind of rolling back a little bit in time. Sometimes these old memories come back. And I've met people who almost have rediscovered their faith, uh, their early held faith, or or kind of begin uh, being moved by that, even if they haven't practiced it for decades. So again, uh, as a family member, if you're on this webinar, uh, be be open to surprise. Uh, you know, it's amazing. People with dementia sometimes forget that they don't do that. And they're actually sometimes more open to new experiences than many of us are who can be kind of shut down. So, so I, I do think um, having religious services, being open to anybody is really good in assisted living uh, and, and, and kind of painting, painting with a wide brush, if that's the phrase, to, to, to kind of have an eclectic uh, a group of spiritual activities can be very, very valuable. Thank you for sharing that all, David. And uh, I think before we open it up for questions, um, I guess I know we talk about um, this topic. If, if you could have kind of one call to action for family family members, care partners um, around this topic of religion and spirituality and, and helping their loved one connect with that, what would that kind of one 
one piece of advice moving forward or what's that one call to action that you would provide? Okay, well, Lakeland, you're always one to challenge me here. So <laughs> let me see. And of course, I'm always one to break a rule or two, so I'll probably give you more than one. But uh, okay, very simple advice about religion, spirituality, and dementia. I think I think that if your family member particularly has a strong religious background, um, I think it's up to us to kind of create that sacred space in many ways as a caregiver to sort of set the stage for them to still practice some of their faith community, uh, some of their faith uh, beliefs. So if you kind of create this spiritual space or sacred space, again, that means that we have to, you know, bring up the, the Bible or, or the Torah or whatever, the religious book or practices. We have to maybe initiate a song, initiate a prayer, initiate uh, some kind of act. And, and often because these are such long held rituals and memories, if we get them started, we can help them really fulfill this uh, sacred space. Uh, because as a friend of mine once said to me that she had worried so much that her husband had forgotten God. And in a support group, someone said, well, maybe God hasn't forgotten your husband, you know, a sort of a beautiful gift that another caregiver gave her in a support group. I, I think uh, my second message, because again, like when you can never just say only give one recommendation. <laughs> I'll let you pass. I, I'm going to say music and being outdoors. Music and being outdoors. When you're outdoors, to me, it's sensory, it's spiritual. Uh, I, 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 if any of you work in assisted living, try to get them outside. I've seen sometimes beautiful outdoor gardens and no one's out there. So, so be outdoors because when you're outside, you get natural uh, vitamin D. It's sensory, it's spiritual, it fights depression, and I think it connects us to Mother Nature and, and the greater universe and to a higher power. And then music. I think music is so magic with dementia care. It, it, it really brings uh, back so much. And whether it be Christian music, religious music, opera, classical relaxation, the Rolling Stones, uh, <laughs> all of that stuff, um, I think can really lift mood and, 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 and foster happiness. Those are great tips. I'm I'm very glad that you did not stick to the one tip rule because <laughs> all three of those were fantastic. Thank you. So, thanks for sharing, David. And we are going to open it up now for questions. We do have a few questions, comments rolling in. So if you're joining us on Zoom, feel free to use the question and answer box or the, the chat function. If you're on Facebook Live, just chat your question below in the comments box and we will get to as many of those questions as we can today. Uh, I see a few questions about the recorded version of this chat. We are recording it and we will put it back out on our Facebook page. So Susan, we will definitely share that back out. And it also goes out, if you join us on Zoom, back out via email. So um, we hope that you will share it uh, or pass it along to someone that you think would benefit. Um, Judy says, uh, Erickson uh, said in his stages of development, the last stage is seeking spiritual. How does this integrate with an older adult who has Alzheimer's? I think that's a very, that's a deep mm. question, Judy. I mm -hmm. think that that is a very, very interesting question. And we, we do, we have a hierarchy of needs. Um, and often we're needing our, our basic human needs met before we can kind of move up in the, the tiers of, um, of our needs. And David, I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, I'm happy to share some thoughts as well. Um. Well, you know, of course, um, taking that quote literally, I guess what I'd like to say is I do think we want to work hard to spiritually connect the person throughout their life, throughout their journey, whether they're a 60 year old younger onset person with dementia or, you know, 92. But I think it certainly is true that most of us, whether we have dementia or not, I think become a bit more reflective about our lives as we get older. Um, certainly when people are on hospice, it's, it's no accident that hospices have chaplains typically to talk about things. So I, I would say that, you know, um, framing someone's life when they have dementia, um, reminding them of their successes, their values, their, you know, dad, you know, you raised three incredible sons and six grandchildren. You, you've had a wonderful life. I'm so proud of you. I think affirming words, um, you know, I think, I think, uh, um, you know, putting um, some kind of uh, faith uh, ritual into the, the last year or two of someone's life and making sure that they're able to feel a closeness to that higher power is important. So to me, I, I guess what I'd say is I think it's perfectly correct that, that late in life, we, we do have this uh, spiritual need. People with dementia also have that spiritual need. Uh, but I think a lot of it too, is that we have to do a bit more of the work to help them 
you know, feel that they've accomplished things in their lives, that they're purposeful, that they've, that they've, they've, they've given spiritual gifts to other people and, and that we're sort of honored and proud to, to be their, their care partner. Thanks for sharing your thoughts on that, David. And we have some more uh, questions coming in um, and we, um, Oh, we have an end of life doula on, on our chat today. Hi, Lori. We're glad that you um, have, have joined us. And um, she says that um, she's an end of life doula in Calgary, Canada, and wanted to mm -hmm. say them that the most of the suggestions given also apply to end of life situations. Uh, the only difficulty she finds uh, that when occurring in long-term care, there is more need for collaboration with members of the facility. So thank you for sharing that, Lori. And um, yeah, David, you mentioned, you know, reaching out to the facility that your loved one lives in and um, connecting to see what, what is offered in terms of, of spirituality and religion. Yeah, I, I sometimes feel that caregivers who have a family member in residential care are, are almost too, uh, too shy or too conservative. You know, if, if you feel that mom has a need, it isn't being met, if you have ideas or concerns, ask the staff to put together a care plan meeting. Uh, some, some states only require them once a year or if there's a change of conditions, but call the executive director or the nurse and say, hey, you know, I, I have some concerns or some ideas or some things I want to bounce off you and either virtually or in person, you know, get that 30 minutes to an hour and, and, and brainstorm. Gee, I noticed dad always used to love to come to music. He's not leaving his room now. What can we do to see if we can get the music to him? So, so I think that is one way to foster that collaboration. A lot of places are terrific. They have really good collaboration you know, between departments, but sometimes it doesn't. And I think we're coming out of the pandemic. The staff uh, have had such stress and strain. Uh, we wanna be a partner. We don't wanna be critical with them, but, but definitely offer your ideas. and. You know, many of you are paying a lot of money for that service. I know my own mother-in-law is in memory care in Sacramento. It's a lot of money. And you, you want to definitely feel that you're a partner in their care. Mm -hmm. Great suggestions, David. Thank you. And, and kind of along uh, the lines of, of this topic, Pam says, that, you know, with, with COVID, many chaplains were not allowed in long-term care facilities. Um, she's asking, how can we get this message of importance to make a change uh, of this essential um, need to residents, or um, it's. I think it's harder, or it was harder with with COVID because many facilities were in a lockdown mode, uh, and so perhaps chaplains weren't able to go into the facility. But hopefully, as we're coming out of this pandemic, uh, that's seeming to lift. But we do again know that the spirituality piece is so important, and I think, um, you know, we we all when I reflect back on the pandemic. I had to rely on my spirituality and faith to get me through some of those challenging mm -hmm. times. So mm -hmm. any other thoughts on that, David, on how maybe as well, we're coming out of COVID to re reapproach? Um, yeah, I think, I think many doctoral dissertations and books are going to be written about this whole uh, pandemic in terms of long-term care. But one of my sadnesses is at its worst, it was almost like it was the medical model versus the social model that you had to like stop all activities and stop this. And mm -hmm. to me, the best places never stopped. They, they kept, you know, working to build um, activity and engagement, even one-on-one -on -one or any way they can. So yes, you're, you're right that many, many, you know, visitors were, were pro prohibited. Uh, I, I guess what I'd say is um, things are opening up and, and you should definitely uh, encourage uh, these visits to start again. Uh, people have had vaccines and I, 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 I certainly hope that the chaplaincy programs are, are back running full throttle. And at least with a couple of groups that I'm working at as a consultant, the, the chaplains are back in the buildings and doing amazing work, not only for the residents, but for the staff and the families. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess that's one thing we haven't covered too much is the spiritual needs of caregivers and care partners. And we, we've talked a lot about the person living with dementia, but that the person who's providing the care and support, whether they're a family member, whether they're a professional working in a long-term care community or working in home care, they also have spiritual needs. And so I think it's important to mention that, that uh, your own spiritual needs, if you're providing care, are equally important uh, and can be a source of strength for many to keep going and to keep providing life-saving, life-sustaining care. Absolutely. And 
And, you know, that's the part that I, I'm so, you know, having developed this thing called the best friends approach to dementia care and, and sort of more broadly thinking about relationships. And I know like when your home instead worker goes in, it's all about a relationship they're forming. Um, and, and, you know, we, we always have professional boundaries, but at the same time, you, you are kind of a friend to your client. And, and, and I do think that fills your, your caregiving spirit when, when you are well-trained, when you're, when you know how to handle things, when you, when you, when you know it's the disease, not the person, when you, when you have, what I like to call the knack of good care, this sort of art of doing difficult things with ease and kind of being creative and being positive. Uh, hopefully our caregivers get a lot of kind words and empathy and support from the patients or the people with dementia, as well as the family members. Mm -hmm. It's a nice little circle of engagement to create this kind yeah. of caring culture. Absolutely. Kind of that that um, all-encompassing community. Um, we did have a question come in via email ahead of time. Uh, this individual, uh, his name's Frank, and he's, he's, his wife has primary progressive aphasia, which is a type of dementia, PPA is what it's called, and she's 65, so she um, is, is younger than probably um, many people uh, perceive a person living with dementia to be. Um, and she's had this dementia for four to five years. And um, her husband has seen significant deficits over the last 12 months. Um, and they are Christians and they believe in the miraculous power of healing. And they've decided to kind of walk with one foot in modern medicine and one foot in kind of um, spiritual healing. But he says that, you know, as his wife progresses, it, it's becoming harder for him to talk with her about spirituality and, and also about what the doctors are saying. And so um, I know that this can be a challenging topic, especially for um, a couple who maybe have walked a certain spiritual journey together and now one individual has dementia um, and they're experiencing cognitive changes. So uh, he's just saying, I wanted to share my story and just see if you had any thoughts or resources for me. So give you any thoughts for, for Frank and his situation? Sure. Well, primary progressive aphasia, PPA, is, is a really tough uh, illness because you, you kind of lose those language centers, the ability to speak and communicate even before the cognitive loss, which, which comes a bit later. Um, maybe someone from your uh, organization could type in, but I do recommend there's an excellent uh, uh, story online uh, about PPA from Jane Brody of the New York Times. If you Google PPA, Jane Brody, New York Times, it's, it's in the public domain. And she wrote a beautiful piece about primary progressive aphasia a few years ago. It's, it goes back a while, but it's very, very helpful. You know, um, I obviously can't comment about sort of a, a, a faith healing um, piece per se, but when I think about the fact that the treatment for dementia in so many ways, even our newest medicine that just got approved last week in a very kind of controversial fashion is not gonna really be that big a game changer for people. I think if you can surround this person with um, love and, and faith and hope, um, certainly it's fighting depression, which is an enemy of the brain and reduces uh, people's ability to you know, really be alive and alert and, and I think give someone hope and meaning and purpose. So I think that's got to have at least your wife working at the best she can be. Thank you for those thoughts, David. And uh, we will uh, share, it looks like we've shared out um, the New York Times article or Christina has put it in the chat. So thank you so much, Christina, for, for doing that. Um, and uh, another person in the chat has mentioned that her husband has late stage dementia participated in a drumming session um, uh, from a, a, an Aboriginal caregiver. And he really enjoyed that activity and ritual, spiritual ritual um, of the stage of healing and cleansing. And he, she said that they all did it together, it seems like, and it was really an enjoyable experience for all of them. So, so sometimes stepping into those other spiritual traditions of, of others can be a neat a uh, way to engage and connect to make those meaningful connections. So thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, we just have some great comments coming in. I'm loving all of the sharing that's going on. Um, if you give me a moment to just kind of read through a few of these. Um, David, I know that a common question that we sometimes get is um, that uh, care, caregivers, care partners don't always feel that their church is very supportive. So any thoughts on that question mm -hmm. while I uh, kind of peruse the chat here sure. to see what's coming in? 
Well, as I said earlier in the webinar, Lakeland, I do think things are getting better, but it has been a bit heartbreaking for me over the years. You know, I've done a lot of support groups over the years, and it's not has not been uncommon for people to say, David, I feel a bit let down by my church or faith community that, you know, I was such an active member for, member for 30 years, and now that I really need them, they're not really here for me. Um, so I, I guess what I'd say is, you know, I'm always a fan as a caregiver of trying to make that request, express your needs and be as specific as, as possible. Let's say you have a son who you don't think is, you know, who lives a mile from you, but it's not helping all that much. I've had caregivers say to me, well, David, he should know what I need. I don't feel like I need to ask him. He should know. Well, maybe he doesn't. I want you to call that son and say, hey, son, you know, I'm out of, I'm out of briefs. Can you go to Costco? I need, you know, the, the 64 pack and would you get it for me by tomorrow? You know, be as specific as possible. And now he may still let you down, but if you make a specific request a couple of times, at least that maybe gives him an opportunity. And of your church, I, I think I would say to your, you know, one of your uh, your church or, or faith community leaders, hey, you know, I'm, I'm really I'm really hurting right now. And, you know, I've been a member for 25 years. I, I really need your help and the help of my congregants. Uh, can I come by and talk to you? Can we do a Zoom? Can you make a home visit and sit in the garden with me? Um, I need some spiritual support. I need some advice and guidance, and I'd, I'd like to figure out a way for my my wife uh, to um, you know to still uh, have a connection to the community. And I think if you ask, you know, could you come by this week? Uh, could I come by this week? Could we have a Zoom call and get it set up tomorrow? You know, I mean, I mean, give it a shot. And and I'm hoping that in most cases, uh, people will be there for you and, and be supportive. Thank and you I just for saw sharing. A comment that. that the Alzheimer's Association has a faith outreach partner volunteers at some churches. Love it. I, I was actually not aware of that. That's wonderful. That is great. Um, I know that Colleen had wrote in. She um, said that you you should when it comes to the topic of music, you shouldn't always assume uh, just because somebody's of a faith tradition that they like the music of their faith <laughs> tradition. She said uh, now she always asks because one woman, she sang a traditional Catholic song and she actually just wanted to hear anything by Pat Benatar. So you never know where uh, the type of music someone will want to connect with. So that is a great comment, Colleen. I think that is I, one of- I have to say that may be my all time favorite story in the last five years. So uh, <laughs> I'm gonna put some Pat Benatar on right after this webinar, I love it. Yeah, and, and it's so true by the way, because you always assume that everyone wants to listen to like, you know, the big band music, but we're forgetting that, you know, the 60s was kind of a long time ago. And so uh, we are gonna have some rock and rollers uh, coming around pretty soon, if not already. Absolutely. We have the uh, David Bowie Memory Care Program at, uh, <laughs> at the assisted living home. <laughs> right next to Margarita. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jimmy Buffett. Now that's a good one. Yeah. 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 I think that just that comment goes back to person centered care and really just getting to know the person. And, um, you know, if you're new walking into a care situation, trying to gain uh, information from family members or even just when I would walk into an, uh, a, potential, a client's house, I would just look around. And sometimes you can just take cues from the environment, too, if there's really no one to ask uh, for that information. But I loved your, your comment earlier, David, about if you were um, a family caregiver, care partner, coming up with a little card for anyone uh, with 10 things that your loved one will, uh, really enjoys or things that make them happy and being able to provide that tool to anyone new that walks into the care situation or provide it to family members. So when they come to visit it sets them up for success. So, And, and Lakeland, um, I love your idea of sort of touring the indoors. If any people on the webinar, maybe professionals who do work in in-home settings, you know, what, what, a, what a gift to be able to kind of look around. And I still remember one time I, I was in someone's home and they had a picture, she had a picture of herself with the Pope in Rome. Like, wow. So I actually picked it up and we started talking about it. So you, you can get a lot of clues and cues. Mm -hmm. Most certainly. I think we have time for about one more question. Um, and so... Um, on kind of along the same lines of, of music, if you're not sure about a person's faith, is there a specific spiritual song or prayer or ritual that might apply to many people? Um, Handy says that she makes uh, videos for people living with dementia and would just like to know what might be a supportive and enriching um, ritual that she could share out. So any thoughts there, any common ones that you come across often, David? Wow, that's a really good question. And I'm not sure I'm going to come up with a good answer for it. I, I guess what I'd say is, you know, maybe, maybe maybe I'll just sort of tackle that question a little bit differently. And maybe Lakeland, you might have some standards you know of. But, you know, 
with memory care years ago, we used to sort of have to feel like we had to tiptoe and we were afraid of making mistakes. Well, you know, I, I think people with dementia are resilient. Uh, um, I think if we put on something they don't like, we'll find out soon enough. Now, if we did it 50 times a week, I think that would begin to damage our relationship if we're really not connecting with them. But, you know, if you try, uh, uh, you know, opera and it's a big bomb, or you try uh, certain Christian country Christian music and it's a big bomb, just don't do it again, or maybe try it again a few months later. I think there's a bit of trial and error, but when you get it right, you'll, you'll get the feedback. So um, I've always felt with dementia care, you know, it, we don't have to follow all the rules. You know, there, you know, every, if you met one person with dementia, you kind of met one person with dementia. My colleague, Virginia Bell and I have always preached that and written about it. So, so really you, you kind of tune it to that individual person and people do change. Like I say, people's tastes change. They may be open to things that never were before. So certainly try some of the great standards and songs and music, but you may find that they might enjoy a George Gershwin or or just some classical music, or even some of the, you know, the relaxation music channels now, things like that. And that can also be, keep people spiritually connected. That's great advice, David. I'm so grateful that you have uh, just shared an hour of your time with us today. I always enjoy talking with you. We could talk for hours and hours, uh, but unfortunately we're coming to the end of our hour. And uh, I, we have just had some great comments. We've had a very engaged audience, and I, I see some sharing of resources happening and sharings of song ideas. So thank you all. I think when we can collaborate and share our experiences, it, it uh, makes us all better caregivers and supporters of those living with dementia. So uh, thank you, David, for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, and everyone, this is part of a, a series. We do a monthly caregiver chat on various topics. So uh, you have tuned in today on religion, spirituality, and dementia. Next month on Tuesday, July 20th, Dr. Aaron Blight, author of When Caregiving Calls, will be joining me to talk about reflecting on your caregiving journey. And he's going to provide some really insightful tools um, for caregivers. So I hope that you'll come back and join us next month for our caregiver chat sponsored by Home Instead. Uh, again, my name is Lakeland Hogan, a gerontologist and caregiver advocate here at Home Instead. I've been joined by dementia expert, David Troxell. Uh, thank you again, David, uh, for joining. Thanks everyone. I hope that you take good care of yourself while you're taking care of others. Have a great rest of your day. Bye. Thank you all.